everyone. My name is Steve Gregorian. I'm the president and CEO of the Detroit Economic Club. And I want to welcome you to today's very special meeting and especially want to welcome our DEC members today. If you're not a DEC member yet, just give me two seconds to myth bust, please. There's no nomination process, no application process, and no job level requirement for becoming a DEC member. We're simply looking for people that want to build their networks with DEC members and also learn from thought leaders on our stage like what we're going to have today. So you can sign up at econclub.org. Just as we get going, I would just ask you to take a peek at your cell phone and silence it so we don't disturb the program. And one of the many traditions of Detroit Economic Club meetings is we always begin by honoring our country, I would just ask you to stand and join me with for the Pledge of Allegiance, and the flag is to my right. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And kindly remain standing as our invocation today will be delivered by Brother Dan Crosby from the Capuchin Franciscans. Brother Dan. Loving Creator God, we thank you for this season of autumn and for what it gently teaches us about what it means to be human. Each year in this season, we look forward to the beauty of trees and bushes as they willingly let go of their summer splendor. What lessons they have to teach us human beings who so often fear change. Too often we see change as weakness instead of strength, as embarrassing diminishment rather than hope-filled enrichment for ourselves and those around us. Loving Creator God, Autumn tries to hush us so we can hear her lessons. Help us during these days to let her quiet our fears and increase our trust. Help us to be people who are open rather than fearful, risking being vulnerable instead of fighting to protect ourselves. Help us to learn from nature all around us so our lives too will reflect something of the beauty, the wisdom, and confident trust of all the trees and bushes. We make this prayer to you Loving Creator God, for in your love you have created everything, trees and bushes, all the seasons, and all of us human beings, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Thank you, Brother Dan. Please be seated, everybody. A quick but important thank you to Detroit Public Television and Lawrence Technological University for partnering with us on today's live webcast. And we love having, as usual, 80 high school and college students with us at every one of our meetings, courtesy of our generous corporate sponsors. No different today. Their day already began with a terrific reception with Mike Corbett. I want to take a moment to uh, let you know who is with us today and the generous corporate sponsors. So. Today, we've got students from Pinckney High School, compliments of Grant Thornton and Jim Tisch, thank you. We've got folks from, students from University of Windsor, thank you, Andy Storm and Eckhart Industries. Waterford Mott High School is with us, thanks to Ryan and the good folks at Oakland County. And Adva Advanced, Techno Advanced Technology Academy is with us, thanks to DTE. Also, City was in an extremely generous mood today and brought three schools with them, Macomb Community College, Cody High School, Melvin Dale High School. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in a round of applause to thank our students and sponsors. <clears throat> a 
Couple things quickly on your tables. Number one, our sponsor brochure. Please take a look at that, patronize those businesses. They are the reason we're here today. I mean that, we would not be here. They fund our operations day in and day out. We thank you if you're part of one of those groups. And while you're looking at that brochure, you might notice our newest, brand new patron sponsor. We are thrilled that City wanted to support the DEC's mission and generously donated $50,000. Thank you. So we can continue to bring people together to learn from thought leaders. So once again, please join me in a round of applause to thank Mike Corbett and the great folks at City. Thank you. Also on your table, our seasonal lineup. We'll see you again if you're a young leader, October 17th. We're having a meeting with uh, former Mayor Dave Bing. October 22nd from Washington, D.C., the EP Administrator Andrew Wheeler. He's coming to talk, frankly, about cafe standards, about coal and all kinds of environmental things that's certainly on everybody's mind. Also on everybody's mind is health care. On November 13th, we're hosting the CEO of Express Scripts, Tim Wentworth. So we hope you can join us if your schedule permits. And I had fun with this one. This day in DEC history, of course, we love to talk about the 85-year history of our speakers. Mr. Corbett, October 8th is a very cool date in our history. You, sir, now join a distinguished list of nine other speakers who graced our podium on this day, and a few highlights. 1945, right here on this stage, actually in this room, World War I flying ace and president of Eastern Airlines, Eddie Rickenbacker, addressed the Detroit Economic Club. 1956, U.S. Treasury Secretary George Humphrey addressed the DEC. 1985, a very popular TV host. Anyone want to think back to the mid-80s? Who ruled the TV talk show at that time? Phil Donahue was right here at the DEC. And in 2013, if you were with us, we were all entertained by Home Depot co-founder Bernie Marcus. And today, we're pleased to add you, Mike, as our 10th speaker on this day in DEC history. Thank you and congratulations. A couple other quick things. If you're a tweeter, we want you to tweet today using at Debt Economic Club. And finally, one of the more popular elements of a DEC meeting is we want to hear from you in the final 15 minutes. You can submit questions through your smartphone. There's instructions right on your table. And those questions will make their way to our presiding officer, who I'm about to put to work. Betsy Meter is Michigan Managing Partner of KPMG. She's a board member and a great friend to the DEC and a huge supporter of many, many things in our community. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Betsy Meter. Thank you very much, Steve. And good afternoon to all the DEC members and guests today. Um, it's my privilege to be your presiding officer today and introduce today's participants. Mike Corbett. Uh, Mike is the CEO of Citigroup, as, as uh, Steve has mentioned, the world's global bank with approximately 200 million customers accounts in more than 160 countries, huge by anybody's measure. Since becoming CEO in 2012, he has focused on leveraging Citi's unique global network to serve its institutional and consumer banking clients with an emphasis on strong execution and the highest ethical standards. Mr. Corbett has been at Citi and its predecessor company since his graduation from Harvard University with a bachelor's degree in economics in 1983. Prior to his current role, Mr. Corbett has held a variety of CEO positions for Citigroup, including CEO of Europe, Middle East and Africa, CEO of Citi Holdings, CEO of Citi's Global Wealth Management Unit, and head of Citi's Global Corporate and Global Commercial Bank. Mr. Corbett is actively involved with several civic and cultural organizations, including his roles an executive committee member of the Partnership for New York City and as a board of trustee of the United States Ski and Snowboard Association. And then Dustin, I'd like to introduce Dustin Walsh, who will be moderating today. Our moderator, um, Dustin, is an award-winning senior reporter for Crane's Detroit Business. I'm sure many of us see his articles on a regular basis. 
During his tenure, he has covered the automotive industry collapse and resurgence, several global supplier conglomerate bankruptcies, and multi-billion dollar mergers and acquisition deals, things that many of us in this room have become very familiar with over the years. He served as an expert source on national and local television and radio programs. Dustin has also won several awards, including the Alliance of Area Business Publications Best Local Coverage of a National Economic Story Award for his coverage of insourcing manufacturing from overseas in 2012. He attended Grand Valley State University and studied journalism. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to bring uh, Mike up to the stage and uh, welcome Dustin for when he's going to do the question and answers. So Mike, if you want to come up and we'll hear some remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Betsy, for that very warm welcome. And I'd like to thank Steve and the leadership and membership of the Detroit Economic Club for this opportunity to speak to such an influential group. <clears throat> when business and government leaders founded this forum during the Depression, our nation faced tensions and challenges that were exacerbated by both a social and political environment. I think the same in many ways can be said of our country today. Americans have lived through the financial crisis. While the government's response, at least in my opinion, was the right one, the crisis has left many feeling as if the system is stacked against them and that it absolved wrongdoers of accountability. To many people in our country, it feels like our era's defining economic trends, including things like globalization, have hurt them economically. And while we have historically low unemployment, Wage growth has been stubborn, and many live with the anxiety of having their jobs disrupted by technology. The wealth gap has widened. Too many believe that their children will have fewer opportunities than they had, and many in our country have lost faith in the American dream. And I think that's caused some today to question whether our capitalist system is in fact the right one. For my part, I believe in capitalism. I believe in free markets. I believe in the right of free enterprise to conduct their business. And I believe in responsible and reasonable regulation. We wouldn't be the country we are today without these. But I also believe that for our business to strive and thrive in today's society, we need to help solve the societal challenges that we all face. We cannot be on the sidelines. We need to have business models that have a positive impact on society and don't rely solely on philanthropy to show that we are solid corporate citizens. Creating shareholder value, in my opinion, will always be necessary, but creating stakeholder value is critical. Today, these two goals are more closely connected than ever before. People increasingly are demanding that private enterprise play a role in finding solutions to the challenges that we face. Employees, for their part, want to work at companies that reflect their own values and their priorities. Our approach to some of these issues is that at our core and at our best, we work with our clients to solve problems. With significant financial resources to deploy, we're scaled to serve our clients and help them compete in today's economy. The clients could be anything from a multinational company like Ford, where I had the, the pleasure and privilege of spending time this morning. It could be one of our commercial banking clients like Edward C. Levy, a legend in road construction founded on a handshake between its namesake and Henry Ford. Or it could be a public sector client, including local governments like the state of Michigan. Our commitment to solutions can be seen through three decisions that we make every day. Who we work with, how we work with them, and how we treat the people who work for us. Think about one of the biggest challenges facing our nation today, and that's our failing infrastructure. The American Society of Civil Engineers today estimates we'll fall $1.5 trillion short of the required infrastructure investment needed by 2025. 
not only are there implications for public health and safety, there's an economic cost to the status quo. The estimated annual cost of highway congestion, $120 billion. Airport congestion and delays, another $35 billion. That's where a bank like ours can help. Our balance sheet allows us to finance projects that would be out of the reach of some smaller institutions. Just last year, city provided financing for $26 billion in U.S. infrastructure projects, including bridges, hospitals, airports, water, and public power. I'd like to mention one project which we did in Detroit, which we are particularly proud of. And that was during the bankruptcy. City committed $60 million from our own balance sheet and subsequently underwrote another $200 million in bonds on behalf of the Public Lighting Authority of Detroit. Those funds financed the installation of over 65,000 efficient street lights, improving the quality of life throughout the city. Thank you. Another challenge, affordable housing. I mentioned the economic pressure too many Americans feel acutely. Over 11 million low-income households in the U.S. today comprise over a quarter of all rental households. Of those, 70% spend more than half of their income on rent and utilities. To address this urgent need, last year, City provided $6 billion in financing for the construction and reconstruction of more than 36,000 affordable housing units. That level of support not only set a new record for us at City, it maintained our ranking as the leading financier of affordable housing in the U.S. for the ninth year in a row. And how about climate change? While some may doubt its existence, we believe it's real and that it's accelerating, and that our collective efforts to address it are the greatest combination of opportunity and risk that we face. According to some of the most recent and compelling scientific assessments, we can't afford to wait to take action. Serious impacts from climate change go well beyond extreme weather events, like the devastating hurricanes that we've been experiencing in the past few years. And at the same time, we need to recognize that many people depend on the fossil fuel industry for their livelihood. We have clients in this sector, and we're not going to walk away from it. Instead, we're working with many of them to support their transition to a low carbon economy, creating green collar careers in the process. In 2014, we made a 10 year, $100 billion environmental finance commitment funding clean energy and other sustainable projects, including the first offshore wind farm in the country. There's great demand for this capital, and as a result of that, we will meet our goal this year, which will be four years ahead of our plans. Let me be clear. None of these projects or transactions I've described up to this point are primarily rooted in altruistic, philanthropic, or idealistic intent. They are core banking activities conducted on behalf of city clients, and yes, they all contributed to our bottom line. However, their value and benefits accrue to many stakeholders, including our communities, our society, our U.S. economy, and more broadly, the global economy. In addition, our core activities as a bank, we also advance our economy and society by supporting nonprofit organizations that tackle such challenges head on. We focused on the need to close the widening gap between the skills of young people and what they need to be able to compete in today's workforce. The U.S. Department of Labor released a report last fall that found there are 7 million jobs at any one time today that employers still can't fill. Our Pathways to Progress initiative is designed to help close the job skills mismatch by providing 200,000 young people over six years with the tools they need through training, work experience, and entrepreneurial opportunities. At $100 million, it's the largest philanthropic commitment in our company's history, 
and I hope shows our willingness to put our profits back into the communities that we serve. Earlier this year, we broadened its scope to help 10,000 older workers who feel as if they've been on the wrong side of globalization or digital innovation to secure employment in, in growth industries like healthcare, transportation, technology, and construction. Several organizations here in Detroit are involved in this $10 million effort. Focus Hope is launching a robotics program to support people looking to build careers in automation, advanced manufacturing, and information technology, fields all helping to grow our economy right here at home. Beyond philanthropy, we also accept that we have a responsibility to have a point of view on certain issues affecting our colleagues and our communities. One is the epidemic of gun violence. After several city colleagues were directly impacted by the Parkland massacre, we decided that we needed to think about where our clients intersected with this issue. We don't seek to take the place of government and we've never intended to offer the perfect solution, much less a new form of gun control. I own guns for recreational purpose and I'm a firm believer in the Second Amendment. Our commercial firearms policy simply asks our retail sector clients to use accepted best practices if they sell firearms. These include age restrictions, completed background checks, and no sale of bump stocks or high capacity magazines. These sales practices are followed by major retailers, including Walmart and Dick Sporting Goods, and have strong public support, even among many gun owners. We also recognize that how we operate as a, as a company is an opportunity to demonstrate our values. We focused on building a better, fairer culture at City, making it as free of racial, gender, and other biases as we can. And this year, we were the first U.S. company to disclose what we call our unadjusted or raw pay gap. And our analysis revealed our median pay for women globally is 71% of the median pay for men, showing that we have a significant issue with the representation of women in senior roles at our firm. And while transparency is great, it's what you do with your data where the rubber actually hits the road. We've set a goal to have 40% of our mid and senior level leaders in our firm globally filled by females by the end of 2021, and we measure our progress against that quarterly. While I focused on city, I'm happy to say that these issues is increasingly infected, affected by our clients and the business community more broadly. In August, the Business Roundtable, an organization of CEOs of major U.S. companies, announced that it had revised its principles of corporate governance. Our revised statement said that responsible business should also take into account the interest of other stakeholders, such as colleagues, clients, suppliers, and communities. As an example, I've cited to show, it's not just the case when other stakeholders win or shareholders lose. Business is not, nor should it ever be, a zero-sum game. Up until recently, Business didn't have enough credibility to take on social issues, but earlier this year, some evidence emerged of a new attitude when the public affairs firm Edelman published its annual trust barometer. And the, revo the results revealed, I believe, a profound shift in the degree of trust that people have for one class of company, and that's their employers. 75% or three out of every four people interviewed globally said they trusted their employers to do what is right for them and for society. That's a welcome shift in perception and a development that business should take pride in. I believe if companies continue to see their role as creating value for stakeholders as well as shareholders, our country will be stronger, our system will continue to show why it creates more opportunity than any other anywhere. Thank you for having me here today, and I look forward to our discussion, and I would like to invite Dustin on stage.
Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you. That was that was delightful. Um, I, I also don't want to show you where media placed on that trust list. Um, all right. So before I get, I really want to do kind of a deeper dive into a lot of these social topics that that, that you you spoke of. But uh, first thing, I would like to kind of get your your kind of barometer on the economy and where it's going. Um, you know, usually when the global economy or the national economy stumbles, Detroit, uh, we're kind of the leading of the spear here. We we fall down a well. Um, so what, what are you seeing in the economy that is, you know, we're seeing some recessionary indicators. What, what are you thinking the long term here is, uh, you know, this year, next year? You know, I've, I've talked publicly that in my 36 years of being in, in the industry and kind of being around uh, companies in the, more, the, the economy more broadly, I've never really seen a time like this. And when you think about where we are today, we are effectively 10 years into a recovery from the great financial crisis. Some people look and say, well, by historical standards, that's long. True, but we have to remind ourselves that recoveries have no memory. As my friends in Australia remind me, 26 years into their recovery. I think second is that as we look at the economy today, it can't be looked at through a single lens. And that is when we look at the world, we have the combination of economic, social, political, and we also have the tiering or the strata of what we would think of as the consumer, business, and government. And I think to really understand where the U.S. economy and the global economy is today, in some ways we need to take those apart. So very simply, when you look at the United States today, two-thirds of our economy is dictated by the consumer. And by the way, the consumer's in pretty good shape. If we go back to the crisis and think about how intervention was done and where stabilization came from, effectively to the, consu to the consumer, two things matter most. One is their job. Do I have a job? Can I keep my job? If I don't have one, can I get one? We could argue se secondary offense around wages, et cetera. But as we saw last week, we've got to go back to 1969 to find a job market with lower unemployment than we have today. And the second piece is housing, right? And when we think about housing out there today, again, we can argue pockets or things, but people feel pretty good about their house. And for certainly in American, many consumers around the world, their home is their single largest investment, often a proxy for their retirement. And if you feel pretty good about your job and you feel pretty good about your home, the consumer is going to be engaged. And that's exactly what we see. Business has been a bit flighty. Right, that throughout these 10 years, business has been engaged, it's been disengaged on the back of tax reform or other things, um, in and out. Um, but business has probably been more conservative. And then I think the other piece is, you know, we're 10 years into what I describe as this unprecedented, massive science fair project called quantitative easing. Right, unprecedented in terms of trillions of dollars around the world. And as we look, and things that we can escape in this globally linked economy is the impact it's had on interest rates, right? Did we ever think, any of us with gray hair or you know, some seasoning in this room, that we would look around and find several major economies in the world with negative interest rates, right? We operate in those places, and it's a strange phenomenon. Right? When you go to somebody and say, hey, give us your deposit, and by the way, you're going to pay to put your deposit in our bank, it redefines the traditional paradigm of how people think about things. I don't believe, and I think we've heard out of our central bank, out of the Federal Reserve, that it hasn't necessarily transmitted as well, and that for now, we're saying we're not a believer in those negative rates, but all that's had an impact. And then you've got to look at the other pieces out there around um, this morning, you wake up, it's China, it's Brexit, it's uh, USMCA and what's going to happen. And so that volatility, I think, has been destabilizing to, um, to business, but fortunately, we've had the backbone of a healthy, strong, engaged consumer. Right. And, uh, I'm running short on time here, so I want to really get into kind of this idea of corporate America's role in, in kind of solving society's ills. Um, you know, 
historically, it's been the government's role to balance society and to provide well-being to its constituents. Uh, you now see that role is sort of being taken on by corporate America. Um, does that mean our government's failing us, or do you, does that mean something has changed? What, what's the fundamental change to where you think your company has to, to, to do the things that you, you've just talked about? You know, I would say from, from our perspective, um, as we look at some of these issues, I, I talked a bit about guns, but as you look at issues that we choose to get involved with, in many ways it goes back and really starts at home around our employees and the expectation of our employees of wanting to come to work for a company that they can be proud of. And so most of the stances, significantly most of the stances that we take are very internally focused around ourselves and our clients and we don't go out in public forums to speak about them. But in the war for talent and the world that we live in, I think taking those stances and people understanding the values of their company uh, are, is really critical. Sure, and, and, and that makes total sense, but uh, what that has taken on in, in this day and age where, I mean, you, I mean, everything is political essentially this day and age, or at least that's how people believe, um, guns are definitely political. How did that conversation, I mean, you had to go to the board with this, I assume, or I mean, they brought it to you, one of the two. How did that conversation go? Well, um, you know, we are, as a bank, and I know we have bankers in the room, we are all highly regulated entities. And it was interesting that we went back and actually looked and after some of these events went back and asked the team, can you come forward and show me our prescribed commercial firearms policy? We actually really didn't have one, which by the way, Dustin, we have a policy for everything, right? So one was to go and then to really look. And again, as I said in my remarks, we didn't look to reset boundaries or change things, but how do we act responsibly with our clients around the things that they're doing and how should we use the firm to support those efforts in, in, in a positive direction. So when you look at what we did there, you know, very simply, we said some age restrictions, maybe with some training, you know, we don't people hand cards to the key, the keys to the card 16 and say, go out and figure it out, right? That around their full background checks, you know, we're going to give you a weapon. And then, you know, around these modifications that, you know, generally serve no, no commercial purpose or no societal purpose and, you know, have been at the center of these. And so kind of working with our clients to be able to kind of put those things forward. It's not things that we simply invented and put out. We were in direct con consultation with our clients to try and promote some best practices. Okay. Um, was there a lot of pushback on that or no? Um, was it smooth? No, it wasn't. Well, I, you, we didn't expect it to be smooth. I would say, you know, the response was as uh, predicted. Uh, one is that um, I had people sending emails, oh my gosh, greatest thing ever done, to uh, people with expletives less than thrilled with, with it. Uh, I would say in general, though, people found our response thoughtful and balanced and, uh, and was very much viewed as a positive. Cool. All right, so obviously you, you've also brought up climate change, another uh, sort of hot button issue. Um, now, if you talk to most economists, they seem to maybe overwhelmingly support a carbon tax. You've publicly said that you don't, you don't buy into a carbon tax. Um, but you've also said government should create other incentives towards sustainability. Uh, like what? Well, what I, uh, just to, to, I won't say correct that, but to, to, to put some texture to it, it's not that I don't believe in carbon tax. I think carbon tax has been quite effective, but I don't think it can be the be all and the end all. Okay. And what I've talked about is the combination of carrot and stick, right? That we've got to have a balance uh, in terms of the way we approach these things. And actually, how do we get businesses to the table to choreograph or to script their own transitions towards what their companies of the future will be? And in there, what we want to do is we want to be in a role of supporting them. We don't want to have to take on the mantle of actually being prescriptive to them of the things they can or they can't do. Because all of these companies, my company included, we're on a journey and a transition. As I talked about fossil fuel, we can as a country, we can as a world simply come in today and say, you know, no more fossil fuels. Right. We've got to come up with the alternative sources, the ways of improving the ways we use it. And that's a journey and requires the help of banks 
to facilitate that shift. So what's a carrot? Just a quick carrot. Um, I think one, I think a, a great carrot is what's happening today around the reaction of financial markets towards those companies that are acting responsibly, right? If you look at the whole invention and evolution of green bonds, right, where bonds are being issued, financing is being offered, and it's being offered at better rates than it otherwise would be offered to companies that are actually dedicating those monies towards this transition. Great, great carrot of, you know, if you're gonna go down that path, we're willing to help you in that journey. Um, now, you, you mentioned inequality, wealth and income inequality. Um, you know, several of the Democratic presidential candidates are calling for arguably aggressive measures, um, higher income taxes, new corporate taxes, et cetera. Um, what role can corporations play in sort of battling inequality within the system? Well, you know, From an I, economic perspective. Sure, I think one is that, you know, when you think of our role, is that it's inclusive finance. That as a bank, we serve a role to society of getting as many people banked and, and as part of the formal economy as we can. Uh, and, and how do we educate people and how do we do that? And what are the things that we can offer them? I talked a bit about from our philanthropic side in terms of not just investing in our own people, but more broadly in the communities that we serve in terms of modernization of job skills and retraining not just you know, around or training around the younger, but actually retraining some of the existing workforce. Mm -hmm. And again, I think if we all come together in these and understand what it is we're trying to shape, I think we've actually got the ability to bend this. Sure, and, and mentioning the jobs and the retraining, um, you know, if we look, obviously in this state and every state, we're trying to get more post-secondary education, whether that's college or, or some sort of technical skill trade. Uh, but if we look, what the prediction of the fastest growing jobs are, they are all low income jobs. 61% um, of the, the jobs created in Michigan since the recession have paid $20 an hour or less. Um, so how do we find the right balance between these low income jobs, education, and the future of work? Well, I think underlying there that, that uh, I'm sure your numbers are right, but I think, again, we gotta go back up a level. And when we think about the United States today, somewhere between 80 to 82% of our economy is service based. Manufacturing about 16, 17% and agriculture in low single digits. So as you describe this grow, or so as you describe that job evolution or kind of what's happened, we're, we're either recycling people out of likely manufacturing jobs into service jobs or we're bringing new entrants into service jobs and that's the fastest growing part of our economy. Mm -hmm. And as part of that, these people are generally coming in not necessarily skilled in some of those services or businesses and you know, they're coming in and getting those skills and we would hope that um, they would have the upward trajectory as they get the required skills to continue to move up. And again, when we think about our economy today, and by the way, when you think of the global economy today, 80% services in the United States, about two thirds services in the world. And so this isn't a transition that we're facing alone. Sure, uh, and I'm kind of wrapping up here. I got one minute, so we have to keep this quick. Uh, obviously, under the current administration, we've seen um, a lot of uncertainty. Uh, tariffs, trade deals that haven't been locked up. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's a new thing every single day that we're not quite sure what the future holds. How, how do you balance with your customers that are, that are trying to expand? I mean, how do, you, how do you help them? How do you bring certainty to their decisions? Well, one is that we um, have tried to take, you know, again, as a company that's been around for 207 years, you know, as they say, this is not our first rodeo. As a company that operates in many places around the world, we've seen these things before. So I think we bring a time perspective and I think we bring a, uh, a, a breadth of perspective back here uh, around dealing with these issues. And again, you know, we uh, try to take the intermediate and longer term view. I just talked about, you know, if we sat here and watched every day the volatility of the market, you'd drive yourself crazy, right, in there. But how do we actually look at the things that are important, make the right investments, and be doing the right things to support our clients and give them the ability to make the decision over the proper term rather than acting to today's headline and trying to provide that support, that insight, uh, the financing, the capital that gives them the ability to do that. All right, thank you. That's uh, my time. I believe Betsy's coming back up for the Q&A portion.
right, we'll spend a little time here, see if I can get this working right, going through some of the questions from the group, Mike, um, and maybe we can just follow on the last topic you were talking about, sort of the trade wars. Um, one of the questions is, what impact does trade wars have on the actual banking industry? You talked a lot about your customers, but perhaps you could switch that and, and talk a little bit about how that impacts banking and city specifically. Yeah, the, the, the bulk of the impact in many ways is the, the second derivative or the second function, and that is that uh, as bankers, our business is a function of our clients' need, desires, success, challenges. And clearly what's happened is around trade, around tariffs, um, we've seen uncertainty put in. We've seen reaction from our clients of the rerouting of trade routes. You know, as an example, the U.S. was a massive exporter of soy to China. Tariffs went in place that stopped. We instantly saw those trade routes reroute such that Argentina and Brazil filled in to become the exporters to China. We've seen supply chain diversification. So our ability to move with our clients and to be able to support them as they're dealing in real time with some of these changes is critical. Um, clearly, you know, from a first function, it's impacting the markets, it's impacting foreign exchange, it's impacting many things that, you know, we've got to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, but it's much more the second function events that we're focused on. Okay, great. Um, you mentioned in your remarks, just briefly, Brexit. Um, one of the questions um, s you know, surrounded that, the, the, the question is, what impact would a hard Brexit have on Citi and other banking institutions in the U.S.? I, I had a, a official, a very high-level official in yesterday from the U.K. government, and I said to him and his team, with all due respect, whatever it is, just get on with it, <laughs> right? That we've been living this for long periods of time, we all believe we're about as well as prepared we can, and that actually the uncertainty around it from a business perspective is the biggest challenge. And so um, I think that we've got to see, right? We don't know mm -hmm. exactly what the, what the ramifications will be. We don't know how the border issue will get solved. We don't know how trade agreements will be structured. But, you know, as we look at the UK, certainly our presence in the UK, it is an important place. It will stay an important place, as is Europe, and we're going to need to uh, be forced to deal with, um, you know, wh wherever they come out on the issue. And so from a business perspective, as we all know as business people, just give us certainty, give us the ability to plan, and we'll process it and move on. Great. Um, Mike, there's several questions about cryptocurrency, sort of, you know, what's your general thought about cryptocurrency? How does it affect your business, uh, your international business? So maybe just talk a little bit about crypto and, and your thoughts around that. Well, you know, when we talk about cryptocurrency, in some ways I want to create a delineation or a segmentation that oftentimes when we talk about cryptocurrency, we get in some ways either this very dark view of a speculative vehicle, my, work, my belief not necessarily in many cases a currency, that somewhere between tax evaders or other bad activities behind, to actually those activities which I think are very legitimate. I think where, where we've had some challenges is that some of the cryptocurrencies that been, have been introduced are not necessarily currencies. They're speculative vehicles. Um, they're not necessarily commercially usable in any kind of um, regular sense. But it's only a matter of time until we get what I would call the digital currency. And the digital currency as coming as a replacement of paper currency or a supplement to paper currency today. It's likely in the not too distant future we will see governments beginning to issue that. And obviously we've seen uh, the announcement by Facebook and Libra and their uh, approach towards a stable, uh, what they call a stable value currency. It's got a basket of currency behind it, which maybe has a broader use. And so evolving real time, and again, like, like anything, I don't think we should be dismissive of it. I think there'll be an evolution to it, and I think there'll be choices around them. Good, thank you. 
Um, you talked a lot about sustainability and city's responsibility and your view on that. Um, one of the questions um, that was put forth is, will city consider only doing business with companies committed to the Paris Climate Agreement? And how do you think about um, the overall environment that we live in today and, and city's responsibility around that? Well, uh, the answer is simply no, that, that um, Paris Clim Climate Agreement, um, we're a subscriber, we're a believer, but I think we've got to take a broader approach than that because we cover businesses of all shapes and size that do all types of things. Some of it may have impact or direct ramifications in terms of what Paris is, but there's much more to it around creating responsible, sustainable paths to the futures of our business. And again, we're here and really what, what we want, and I think my fellow bankers would sympathize or agree, is we don't want to be in the position of setting or enforcing your policy. We really want to be in the position of you working with your stakeholders to create the right path forward for your company that has buy-in in the round, and it's our responsibility to support you on that journey. So we don't want to be the traffic cop. We don't want to be the rational, the person rationing valuable resources, but we actually want to be the encouragement and the support of whatever that transition that's bought into feels like. Okay. Um, kind of changing direction a little bit. Um, how do you deal with legal uncertainty of cannabis banking? Um, obviously, that's something that a lot of people in Michigan are talking about. I had about. that written down, but did you already have that down? Um, you know, as a as a nationally chartered, federally insured bank, the decision's easy. We are prohibited by law mm -hmm. that if we were to uh, uh, be part of that in the United States, we would be breaking our charter, we would be breaking the law, we would lose our FDIC insurance, and we would lose our license. So that would be a bad day. Yeah. Um, so what we are pushing for, like many things, is rather than this being governed at the state level, our national politicians need to take this topic on, and I think they need to come to a decision in terms of, from a federal perspective, uh, how this should be approached. And once that's decided, uh, we're more than happy to support that. Okay. Um, there's one question that came in, um, I, I'm sure it's from a student, um, and, and I think your insights would be helpful. I know you talked a little bit about this with the student group, but how can we make ourselves better problem solvers and make us stand out um, you know, as we're leaving college and entering the workforce? What are some you know, suggestions or thoughts that, that maybe even helped you as you graduated from college and moved on, but the, the, you know, the, the, the things that make a difference to an employer and maybe some advice around that to the to Well, the it's the, the same advice, um, as I said earlier to the group, I've, uh, my wife and I have a 30-year-old and a 26-year-old. It's the same advice I give them, and it's the same advice that I give our people joining our company every year, and that is keep your base wide. Right? We're in this world that's changing so rapidly, and too often I sit down with really energetic, excited young people, mm -hmm. and they've got this narrow view of where they want to go and what they want to become. I would take advantage of everything out there to build my foundation today as broad as I can build it to give me all the flexibility through life. You know, when I think back 36 years ago around what banking was and what the hot sectors were and what they weren't, you know, if I had focused myself or pinholed myself into those things, I likely would have um, probably had to gone backwards in my career to retool myself. And as time goes on, that only becomes more painful, more costly, more difficult. And so invest in yourself today, build the widest base you can build continue to take advantage of that, and naturally your career path will narrow itself and allow that to happen naturally rather than forcing it. Okay. Uh, one last question before we go into the lightning round. Um, there's a couple questions around regulation and whether you feel that the banking industry regulation today is at the appropriate level, um, and is it in place that would, you know, limit the ability for a 2008 to occur again? Well, I, I, I do feel we're, you know, somewhere in the zone. And what I mean by that is what, what we've talked about, what I've talked about publicly is that we're not asking 
at all, either as a banker or as an industry for Dodd-Frank to go away. But what we would really love is harmonization of regulation that we had a lot of regulation in our industry put forth between the years of 2008 and call it 2012. Many of those regulations uh, sit at multiple regulators and some of those regulators don't actually agree on what those regulations say and how they should be implemented. So in our case, what I say is kind of don't care, pick any version of it, but please pick one and we're happy to live by it. What's really difficult is when we've got multiple regulators all taking different approaches, all expecting us to be compliant with the differing views of the regulation. Um, in particular to 2008, I think when you look at the capital in, in the industry, the liquidity in the industry, the oversight of the industry, I think it's a completely different industry today than it was in touch wood around stress testing and all of the things that we do on a very regular basis I think the numbers show that the, the industry would have the ability to certainly withstand a 2008 and beyond. Okay, great. So now, as is tradition with these meetings, we like to have a lightning round. So these are quick questions and long or short answers, however you decide to answer it, um, is great. So first one, something on your bucket list. Something on my bucket list would be um, hella skiing in the Himalayas. Outdoorsman, I can tell. He was talking about fishing, so I know there's a lot of that. Um, person other than a family member that you would like to have lunch with? David McCullough. One of your favorite songs? Happy birthday. <laughs> as long as you're standing up, that's great. Uh, a favorite team growing up? Pittsburgh Steelers. Your best sport? Best sport or favorite sport? Give me either. Uh, my best sport was uh, growing up. I played football in college. My favorite sport is probably, and I don't know, is it a sport, fly fishing? Absolutely, Absolutely. fly fishing. It's, it's a sport for me. Uh, last book you read? I'm sorry? Last book that you read? Uh, this past weekend, I read a book called The Roadside Scholar. One of your favorite movies? Shawshank Redemption. Favorite vacation spot? Favorite. Vacation spot? Italy. Um, and describe Detroit in one word. Transformational. All right, and last one, advice to your 25-year-old self. I gave a little bit of it, so I won't repeat that, but I would also say um, take advantage of the world. You know, one piece of advice that I've learned and I give my kids and I give anybody who listen is as you are growing up, your life is never gonna be less complicated than today take advantage of that. Great, thank you very much, Mike. Thank you. One very quick announcement before we adjourn. If you enjoyed today's program, there's three ways you can experience it. Again, you can download the audio podcast wherever you download on your phone. That should be available about this time tomorrow. Uh, you can watch the program on Detroit Public TV's website, probably tonight. And if you're an Xfinity customer, you will find it in the Get Local On Demand section in just a day or two. Mike Corbett, thank you for choosing the DEC, for your support of the DEC, and for traveling to be with us. Thank you. <laughs> Dustin Walsh, Betsy Meter, you always do a terrific job for us. Thank you both for your time. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for coming today. On time, every time, this meeting is adjourned. Thank you.